welcome to DIY guitar making. I'm here in the shop. I'm going to be doing some last minute prep work for the hands-on workshops, which are starting very soon. September 2nd is the first workshop. And then basically all of September, October, and half of November, I'll be doing the other workshops as well. That, of course, is the hands-on guitar build workshop where uh, I have two students come in per workshop and we, each student builds their own flat top acoustic guitar together with me. What I'm doing today towards that end is um, actually just in the mail received a bunch of these are neck blanks for sized for a ukulele 3 by 3 by 18 so great for making a ukulele neck, but I will be chopping these down into smaller pieces to use as heel blocks and assembling them onto the orchestra model size guitar necks that we'll be, we'll be using in the hands-on guitar build workshops. So yep, I will be cannibalizing these ukulele necks, which is something I do a lot, by the way. Um, that's a little tip for you. To get good heel block or um, neck block and tail block, all of those mahogany blocks that we use on an acoustic guitar, you can just use straight up neck blanks and actually save a little bit of money by chopping those into smaller pieces. I find that it's cheaper to buy neck blanks like this and chop them down than it is to, from the luthier suppliers, buy heel block material that they sell explicitly for heel blocks. Just something to think about. But that's not what I'm here to show you guys or talk to you guys about today. We're here to do your questions. So let's go ahead and get started with that. So this first one uh, is in relation to a video that I, the last video that I just did on tapping guitar plates. So he writes, great video, this is B Power, that's his name. B Power writes, great video about tapping the plates. I've only completed three guitar builds so far. I've done the tapping thing on all the pieces. Pretty much because it is cool to hear how long it resonates, and I feel like a real builder. <laughs> I'm sure this is a skill that needs to be learned over time, so I'm going to continue tapping on the wood and try and ignore all the weird looks I get from my wife. Excellent. Um, I just wanted to share that one. Obviously, it's not a question, it's a comment, but I, w I wanted to bring that up because this is such a common thing. Everyone seems to struggle with this. We all get weird looks. You're actually, I think, I think, supposed to feel a little bit silly when you're tapping on guitar wood. And um, it's really a... To use an old cliche, it's a journey and not a destination. So you're never going to get there and be like the wise old sage in the wood shop that no, that just taps on something and, and instantly knows its full potential. So I will say uh, what my turning point really was in this regard, because I used to just not trust my intuition on this at all. My turning point really was when I began, I just kind of decided to trust myself. Even though I didn't have the experience yet to really be able to say anything intelligent about what I'm hearing when I'm tapping, I just decided basically that my viewpoint was valid. Okay? And rather than always falling back on... Uh, which is what I used to do, always falling back on known dimensions and just saying, okay, I, I can't tell what I'm hearing, so I'm not going to mess with this anymore. I'm just going to thickness it to 125 thousandths of an inch because I read that somewhere. They know better. I'm going to go with that. What, what I did was, I, I can remember the guitar that I did this on. I just trusted myself and I said, eh, I'll thickness it a little further. And when it got to a point where I was like, okay, this just sounds resonant to me and I wasn't very confident in that assessment but I was this 
confident in it. I was slightly confident. And that was enough for me, at least at that time, because I had decided I'm going to trust myself. Anyway, I finished that guitar and that guitar was great. I noticed the difference. So ever since then, I've learned to trust my intuition more. I think there's a certain type of person and it is the type of person that tends to get into something like guitar making where you're very engineering brained and so you need some sort of confirmation, right? Some almost like an authoritative, like an authority to come down and say, yes, that is what you want. That is an optimal tap tone. Unfortunately, that sort of thing just doesn't exist. We live in a world of just intuitive vagueness, right? So we have to recognize that. We have to trust ourselves. Tap, feel foolish when you're tapping. That's fine. Get the weird looks from your friends and your wife <laughs> and just roll with it, right? And just keep building guitars, keep iterating. Every guitar you will get slightly better at it as you build up more data points in your brain with every time you tap, complete the guitar and play it, right? You get a new little data point every time that says, oh, that was good or eh, that wasn't so good. So just get started. Just do it. Okay. Thank you for that. B power. The next one on the same topic is from Scott Merkel. Scott Merkel writes, I've heard that some builders rely more on flexing the top, i.e. stiffness, than on tapping to determine the optimal thickness. What are your thoughts? Uh, yes, so there's lots of ways to skin a cat here. Uh, I am a big fan of flexing the top, but for me personally, and, and this isn't what everyone does or what everyone has to do, for me personally, I rely heavily on flexing the top at a later stage of tapping, which is when the braces are attached and you're carving the braces and truly voicing that top, right? At that stage, I rely heavily on the feel, the flex that I get from flexing across the X brace arms, okay? Kind of like that. Uh, more so than the tap at that stage. At this earlier stage where you're just thicknessing the top, which is what we talked about in that video, you can absolutely flex it. You, wanna, you can flex cross grain and with the grain and you'll get a different feel in both directions and you can log that in the intuitive part of your brain. So you have a data point for the next time you do it. Uh, I just don't do that at that point. I just tap. It's just, you know, what I've always done, so it's what I continue to do. But absolutely, at both stages, the thicknessing stage and the brace carving stage, you can flex, okay? So yeah, I hadn't talked about that at all in the tapping video, I hadn't even mentioned flexing, so I'm glad you brought that up. Honestly, if you're just, you don't have a good ear, um, and uh, honestly, I don't have a great ear, just so you guys know. Um, I have an okay ear. But if, let's just say you have a terrible ear, you really struggle with, you know, having the confidence to hear anything when you're tapping, you can just trust your tactile sense then and go with pure flexing. Okay? Something to think about. There's no wrong, well, not no wrong way, but <laughs> there's lots of ways to skin this cat, I should say. Next question comes from Kevin Weeb, I'm going to say. Weeb? I like Weeb. I'm going to go with Weeb. Kevin Weeb writes, Hello, Eric. I've been watching quite a number of your videos online and have found them quite informative and helpful for a lot of my questions. Well, thank you, Kevin. I was wondering if you had any videos or resources available about a particular issue that I'm facing. I am building a guitar and the back and sides are made of Pau Ferro and has a, it has a beautiful lighter colored strip down the center of the back 
and each of the sides has a narrow strip of that same light colored wood along the edge. I am wondering how to save the light colored edge through the radiusing and binding process so it doesn't get sanded and routered away. Okay, so I think that's his question. I want to read what else is here. I was thinking that I could begin by making... All right, um, I'll just stop his question there because that is the heart of the question. I am wondering how to save the light colored edge through the radiusing and binding process so that it doesn't get sanded and routered away. So what he's talking about, actually, let me grab a guitar. I'll show you what he's talking about. All right, so what he's talking about is this. Sometimes on a set of sides, you have some sort of feature on there, right? In this case, we have this really awesome looking band of sapwood. Now the light colored strips on Pau Ferro, um, I'm not sure if that's sapwood or just color banding that's natural to the wood. Either way though, he's got something like this and he wants, to, he wants it to remain on the sides. If it's a very small amount, it's very likely that through the process of sanding the radius into the top, as he mentioned, and through the process of doing the binding, because the binding eats up part of your sides, right? We have to route a ledge there and install, uh, in this case, an ebony strip. That's going to also cut into your color there. Now this one, this particular piece I got really lucky. Uh, I just found a really great piece that had a huge sapwood line running all throughout. So you get plenty of sapwood to feature that look. Okay, and you can see there's a lot going on on the back too. This is kind of what he was talking about as well, having some stripe of sapwood down the center. Uh, I brought another guitar to show you. Just because this one has a similar thing going on but it has what I would call the minimum amount of a featured color or sapwood to be shown. And I say that because if you had a side set that had less sapwood than this after the binding is attached and everything's radiused and all of that and it's leveled down, if you had less than this, I don't think it would look good. And the reason I say that is because when you have less sapwood than what you see here, it almost looks like a defect. It looks a little strange. You need about, I don't know, I would say at least um, almost like a quarter, no less than a quarter, an eighth or a quarter of the width has to feature that wood, otherwise it looks weird. Right? I mean, intuitively, you, you know what I'm saying. You can't have too little of this. The reason I'm spending so much time explaining that is because it's a common problem that I see. Uh, people get side sets with a cool feature on it like that. They want to keep it and in the end, very often what you end up with is just a tiny little sliver of it left over. And in that case, it honestly would have been better if you eliminated that sapwood completely. Because again, it's just gonna look off if it's a very small highlight, okay? That's the first thing I wanna say about that. So be careful of that, about that and be realistic and decide early on Am I actually going to be able to save this or am I going to end up with this awkward little sliver of white uh, amidst a sea of darker brown colors that's going to look just kind of off and weird, okay? But, so if you do have a piece that has a nice, fairly large showcase of sapwood or uh, colored banding or whatever it is, then one thing you can do to at least buy yourself a tiny little bit of leeway there is 
take your two blocks when you're gluing them, the neck block and the tail block, and just move them up as far as you can to one edge, maybe even a little bit higher than the sides itself. So that way when you radius sand that whole rim set, um, you are basically radius sanding down to as much as you can that edge of the sides. So you're not eating into it as much. And that's kind of what he, I didn't read the whole comment there or question, but that's kind of what he was asking if he could do that. And my answer to you, Kevin, is yes, you can move those blocks as close to that colored banding as far as you can push it up on the sides. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Next question comes from Keith Short. I get a lot of great questions from you, Keith. So thank you. I always like uh, your comments on things. And this one actually is a comment. It's not a question. Uh, I actually have a bunch of comments here about scrap wood and I want to read them all because I had asked you in a previous video, hey, what do you guys do with your scrap wood? Okay, so here are some of those answers. Keith Short writes, scraps allow me to bond with my neighbors. They burn it in recreational fires, pound the drum, pass the bottle, kumbaya moments. Perhaps a boomer thing. <laughs> um, I am not a boomer, but at heart, I am probably more boomer than anything else. Technically, I'm a millennial, but... Um, I love those pound the drum, pass the bottle, kumbaya moments. I, I grew up on those. So I can totally relate to that. Keith, uh, and, and honestly, I think, you know, I was talking before in the video about how scraps can, you got to be careful because they can honestly become more of a problem than a help because they just keep building up, right, until you're up to your neck in scrap wood. Uh, so I, I tend to burn it in my wood stove a lot, but this is a great use of scrap wood legitimately because what is more valuable, you're taking essentially a valueless material, which is waste, scrap, and you're turning it into human connection. And what is more valuable than that? That's pretty cool. Good times with your friends. I like that. Bill Stoner, on the same topic of scrap wood, writes... Thanks, Eric, for discussing your scrap wood. I certainly understand your reasoning, and as you say, you are getting use from the scrap. He's talking about, I'm getting use because I burn it in my wood stove, and hey, that's heat. Heat is good. For me, and you're not there by any stretch, my grandkids will ask for some shop time for their projects. The scrap box is a good place to start. It's been a few years ago, but a grandson was fascinated with the drill press and wanted to drill holes. We took a piece of scrap cherry and cut it into three quarter inch cubes. Then we built a jig for holding the squares. I set the drill depth to roughly the depth of the bevel of the bit, and he proceeded to drill the six faces of 96 dice. He loved it. Again, thank you for your con contribution to Hobby Shoppers. Thank you, Bill. Um, thank you a lot, actually, because that's a great response that actually gets me thinking about my own children. I have two kids. They're both under two years old, so <laughs> they're not in the shop at all yet, and they shouldn't be. But this is something that I will certainly be looking forward to in the future with my own children, and scrap wood will definitely play a part in that. So there's no need for me to save up the scrap wood right now because I'm always producing new scrap wood, but at some point, yeah, I'd imagine I'll be burning less of it because uh, the kids will be doing all kinds of cool stuff in the shop, and that would just be fantastic. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I actually hadn't thought of that, so now I'm thinking about it. D-A-L-G Guitars writes, Wood-fired pizza oven, good for clean hardwood scraps. Oh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> I actually used to have a... Um, uh, me and a, fr a friend of mine had built a an outdoor pizza oven in uh, the the backyard of the wood shop here, and uh, unfortunately, at one point we did we didn't we did something wrong when we built it, and at some point uh, months down the road, it collapsed under its own weight. So 
it's unfortunate. But um, yeah, that would have been a really fun use of scraps, making wood-fired pizzas. All right, Steve Carver says it's great for inlay. That is the, for, for most people, that is the, the prime use for scrap wood, at least within guitar building. People save their scraps so the, they can either practice inlay or even just, you know, commit to an inlay on an instrument. That's a great point. Um, and also, I, I want to make the point that wood inlay is far uh, easier to execute than pearl inlay. You're not, it's a, uh, your blades don't break as often. It's a lot easier to do tight turns and things like that with a jeweler's saw. So, um, just to add to his point, wood scraps are excellent inlay material and often overlooked because of mother of pearl. And you can, you can do some really, visually, you can do some really stunning stuff with wood. Uh, just because there's so much variation there. Okay, uh, Himalayan BG Guitar Workshop writes, Hey Eric, my question... Okay, there's, I, I gotta... <laughs> this is hard to read. Um, is why are nylon class... Why don't nylon classical guitars have a trust rod? I, <laughs> why don't nylon classical guitars have a trust rod? Okay, sorry, there's just a lot of typos and grammatical things there. Um, <clears throat> I love, by the way, that he called it, it was, it was probably an autocorrect on his phone or something, but either way, he called it the trust rod, which is honestly a better name for it than the truss rod. So obviously, it's called the truss rod because it trusses, it supports the neck um, structurally. But from the player's perspective, who has no idea what's actually going on inside that guitar neck, they just see this little hex head poking out either in the sound hole or on the headstock end, and they are just placing their Allen key in there and turning it, and they're trusting. They're just trusting that turning in a certain direction will have a certain result, as far as how that happens, it's just magic to them. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate to that feeling, <laughs> either when you first got into guitar tech or guitar making kind of stuff, or even before that, just as a player, if you guys are players as well as builders. So yeah, I like that. I'm gonna say we should call it the trust rod from now on. That's cool. Uh, but he, this is an actual question, <laughs> so I'll answer his question, and it's a good question. So, nylon classical guitars, uh, cl classical guitars, if you don't know, are nylon strung, okay? There's no such thing as a uh, steel strung classical guitar, and that, that is the main difference between the two types. Uh, those nylon strings are extremely lower tension, extremely lower on tension than steel string guitars. A steel string guitar has somewhere between 160 and 200 pounds of force pulling on that bridge and cantilevering down on the fretboard tongue. So there's a lot structurally that's going on there that needs to be resisted. And um, a classical guitar, I don't, I don't build classical guitars. I don't you know, live in that world of classical guitars. So I could be off a little bit here, but I think if I recall, a classical guitar has about somewhere around like 80 pounds. You guys can correct me if I'm off, but I don't think I'd be off by too much. Uh, either way, it's half or less than half of a steel string guitar. So that's very significant. So, the steel string guitar is actually what birthed the truss rod. The concept of using steel strings then created the need to add some extra structural support to the neck because those steel strings over time essentially uh, warp the neck into 
a forward bow position if it didn't have a truss rod. So that's the role of the truss rod. And yeah, so classical guitars, they just don't need them. They never have. So it's not that if you put a truss rod in a classical guitar, it's not really going to cause any problems. And it could help against... Um, so yeah, the, the string tension isn't really going to pull it into a forward bow, but possibly if you know you left it in the hot attic or something like that, it'll warp in some way, and the truss rod maybe could possibly mitigate that. So you could put a truss rod in the classical guitar, but not having the truss rod in there, you have the advantage of um, the the neck just not weighing as much as it does on the steel string guitar and typically those players just kind of like that light feel of the neck so between it not being necessary and it allowing the neck to be physically lighter we just don't do it on classical guitars there you go all right uh that's it okay cool we're done. I'm going to go get to work uh, on prepping these parts for the hands-on guitar build workshops that are starting very soon. I will see you guys in the next one. I'm not sure if I'll be answering questions in the next one or doing a demonstration, but I will have more content coming out for you very soon. Bye for now. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.